call the uh, meeting to order. We got a few folks coming in and Convention of States folks, if you can hear me, raise your hand. <laughs> if you're not a Convention of States person and you're talking, please raise your hand. All right. We're going to get this meeting started. We got some folks that are joining us by Zoom. Um, and uh, we've got a few that will be joining us here in a few minutes. Uh, Senator uh, Harputlian, um, we, uh, we have, uh, I was thinking we'd get a, a message from the Russian front, uh, the Ukrainian front, uh, or at least the Slo Slovakian front, uh, where Senator Harputlian uh, is... Uh, so, well, that one too. Uh, anyway, somewhere over yonder, uh, way across the, the time zone, Slovenia, Slovakian is a type food. And someone waved at Slovakian. Hey, how are you? Um, anyway, so we're going to get started. And uh, folks, welcome. Um, again, if you're a Convention of States person and you haven't been to the State House before, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We already done that. Yeah. Anybody who's not been here before to the state house, please raise your hand. All right. We really welcome you. And uh, the word got out. Y'all came, uh, and we're glad to see you. Uh, Christine, welcome. All right. Thank you. We'll go next to uh, 133. It's Paula Benson, Madison. Folks, this is about the time that y'all might want to take about a 10 or 15 minute break. Y'all, we've got lemonade out on the front porch. Yeah. And uh, if you will all make your way out now, goodbye. Goodbye. Paula, take it away. And uh, Senator Campson is our subcommittee chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, these are a series of bills which concern Article 5 applications um, to the Congress to call a, a, a convention of states. S-133, as introduced, is a joint re resolution which would make an application to impose physical restraints, limit federal power and jurisdiction, and have term limits. In, included in S-133 are instructions to Congress about uh, Congress performing only ministerial duties, there's also a very detailed um, description in S-133 about how delegates or commissioners are selected and how that they may be recalled, and also instructions uh, to the delegates prior to the convention uh, about um, uh, what uh, their duties are in the convention and uh, what happens if they exceed their duties. H-3205 is very similar to S-133 in that it also is a joint resolution to impose fiscal restraints, limit federal power and jurisdiction, and have term limits. It has some language also talking about Congress's ministerial duties. Um, it, it, it specifically limits its application for a period of 10 years. And in talking about uh, delegates to a constitutional convention, it uh, asks that uh, when determining commissioners or delegates that the electing body take into account race, gender, and age so as to represent to the greatest extent possible all segments of the population of the state. S-141 is a concurrent resolution, and it deals with a balanced budget. It is a a single application request for a balanced budget convention of states. S-887 is a general bill. It would add statutory requirements that provide for an oath of office for anyone serving as a commissioner or an alternate to a convention of states, and it would provide that a commissioner or an alternate who is convicted of violating the oath is guilty of a felony and upon conviction could be imprisoned for up to 10 years. Mr. Chairman, as reported out of subcommittee, S-133 
and H3205 were both amended with strike all amendments to insert the model language that is re recommended by the Convention of States Organization without additional language that was in either of those joint resolutions. S-141 was reported out of the subcommittee without an amendment, and S-887, the general bill, was reported out with a clarifying amendment that if the, um, if a section, if an Article 5 convention is called, the General Assembly would determine how the commissioners and alternates were selected. Mr. Chairman, the um, amendments that were passed out of subcommittee were passed on a 3-2 vote um, by the members of the subcommittee. Paula's uh, description, uh, you want to add anything to that or? Uh, well, Paula, um, Ms. Benson made a was very precise, as she always is, and um, gave an accurate description. I would say that the uh, adoption of the Convention of States language is an effort to have similar language that other states have so that a court or Congress could not consider it a separate and new and independent application and start the count all over again because you have to have 34 states under Article 5 to call a convention of states. You have to have 38 states. You have to have 75 percent of the states ratify a Article 5 proposed amendment. So that's a, that's a safeguard, a very important safeguard from a convention being a, a um, runaway convention or producing a result that does not have wide, broad, broad support among the states. And, um, and so that's why we adopted that amendment and by, with S-133 and then amending H-3205 uh, with the same language, we, it's really a procedural effort to have two vehicles, one a Senate bill and one a House bill. The House bill is further along. So that would be the vehicle that we would we would use. All right. Uh, so discussion about that now. Uh, Senator Harputlian has asked to be recognized with a question. To um, Sen Senator Campson, um, and, and I've done a little research on this, but as I understand it, um, once you send these folks to a convention, you can't really. Um, you can't restrain them from what they're going to do. They, for instance, could repeal the Second Amendment if they wanted to. Am I correct on that? <laughs> um, no, there are some allegations to that effect. But if you if you really look at the um, the history of, of ratifying conventions, like like the senator from Edgefield several years ago sent me a book during the off season while we were out of session, I read the um, ratification, which is Pauline Meyer's account of the ratifying conventions in each state. And when you understand that state by state and you get an idea of what conventions were and the, and the, the framers understood them to be a ad hoc meeting in order to address a single issue within parameters and then to adjourn, and that's the, and so the, that's the way the U.S. Constitution was ratified throughout the nation, and um, and so and there there is a safeguard too, Senator, because actually I was previously a, against this concept, and I studied myself to position to be for it, and um, if you read this book, you might do the same, Senator. It's light reading. It's like eight hundred and. 833 pages, but um, it's a long plane ride back. Yeah. But it's a long plane name, ride back, that, right? Senator, <laughs> Senator go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm in Slovenia, as you know. I couldn't see the you cover of that book. Could you tell me what it is, please? Uh, Far From Unworkable by Timothy Drake, which is an account of, okay. of the convention, the framers, the framers ideas and actually or original writings and manuscripts and comments upon the convention. But the book that I mentioned that you may want to read while you're 
overseas is a very intriguing book in its ratification by Pauline Meyer. It's a very, very interesting book about the state so, so, conventions that ratified the U.S. Constitution. So, uh, let me ask you this, though. Could not a, could we not pass, and I mean, does it have to originate at a convention, or can we each state pass a specific provision? Here, I noticed one of the big concerns here is a balanced budget. Could we pass uh, something without it going through a convention? Well, the only the framers gave us two ways to amend the Constitution, and in classic framer fashion, they divided that power between the federal government and the state government, like they did numerous times. You're very familiar with this, with federalism, the concept of federalism. Um, the elections clause is even something that's talked about today and they divided that power. They gave it primarily to the states but ultimately to the federal government. And there's many instances where they divide that power and diffuse it and this is one of them because in Article 5 Congress can initiate an amendment to the Constitution and the states have their own way to initiate um, the, the, an amendment to the Constitution. And, um, Hamilton talks about it in Federalist 85, that we may safely rely on the disposition of the state legislatures to erect barriers against encroachments of the national authority through this process. And so really what Hamilton said was this is an arrow the framers gave, put in our quiver at the state level to use against federal overreach and excessive use of power, excessive spending or various issues. And so that's, that's and, and they gave it to, to the state as a means to amend the Constitution. The, Cong the federal government has a means. And so there you have this division of power over the, uh, the, con the uh, constitutional amendment process. Samuel Jones from New York at the ratifying con uh, convention he gave another reason. The reason there are two modes for amending the Constitution, I suppose, is this. It could not be known to the framers if there was too much power given to the federal government or too little given to the federal government. They therefore prescribed a mode by which Congress might secure more power if, if they didn't have enough, if it was found necessary, and they prescribed a way for the states a mode of, of restraining the federal government if upon trial, error, and experience it was found necessary to restrain the federal government. So they basically set this thing in motion, this constitution, and they really, they, they created a way for, to tweak the balance of powers between the federal and the state, the, the national and the state governments. And so there's many instances of that as the reason given to, 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 uh, for an Article 5 convention initiated by the states, which, I, again, I was originally opposed to it, but after having studied it, I really studied myself to position to be supportive of it because I understood the framers' well, it, vision and it, it, reason for doing it. Has there ever been, when was the last time we had a constitutional convention? It was the original constitutional convention the last time, but yeah, we, so we came the, really so close in the no, we came really close in, in 1917 on the 17th Amendment when we were one one state away from adopting that through a convention of states process, and that precipitated Congress initiating the 17th Amendment and having it ratified. And that's the amendment that made but, but, U.S. senators elected properly instead of by the state legislature. So, so I guess my question is this. This is my major concern. Um, we send folks to a constitu constitutional convention. I looked. I can't find any case, any – I mean, there's theories. They quote Hamilton or whatever. What is to prevent them from doing more than something on a balanced budget? Could they repeal the Second Amendment? And I can't find a single source – that says once they go there, they can, they, they're free to do anything they want. I mean, they, they're prohibited from doing anything else. Is there something, some, something I, I've read the, obviously read the, the, the amendment, the, uh, the, the Constitution, but I can't find a single case, Supreme Court or otherwise, interpreting that in any way, shape, or form. Am, am I wrong about that? There's no Supreme Court case 
about that, although there is a history of conventions sticking by the subject matter. So if you had a, you had a, a court presiding over a, quote, runaway convention, first of all, a, a convention is not going to be run away when you have, you have a three-quarter ratification requirement. That's really the safeguard, because I'm concerned about that, too. But when you have three-quarters of the states have to ratify whatever the outcome is, first you have to have you have to have two-thirds of the state delegates agree, then you have to have three-quarters of the states agree agree with, with their product. And the chance of a runaway convention receiving that kind of support is, um, is very, very slim in my view. And I think the framers slim, held that view as not well. Impossible. Slim, not uh, virtually impossible. Virtually impossible, I would say. Virtually yeah, you'd have to have 38 states agree. You'd have to have 38 out of 50 states agree for whatever the product of the convention is. That's a very high number, very high threat. I mean, it had to be something that, that, that red states, blue states, east coastal states, flyover states, northern states, southern states, they'd all have to agree. I mean, it would be really big, major issues that aren't extreme that if to get 38 states to agree through their ratification of the of the uh, proposed amendment, and, it's, Thank and, you, and as, as a state lawmaker, it is a it is a arrow that the framers put into our quiver to use and to push back against the federal government if we think it's getting too big, spending too much money, getting out of touch. All right. Uh, any further questions or comments? Senator Kimbrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I'm not as learned as the senator from Charleston, but I've, I've heard people repeatedly say today, because everybody's email inbox is full on both sides of the subject. And um, I, I have long supported Article 5 convention. And one of the things that the senator from Charleston pointed out, and I think this is important to uh, our friend in Slovenia to, to, for us to make very clear, this is not a constitutional convention. This is an Article V convention under the Constitution. And I think that's one of the things that people have lost focus of. Nobody's talking about putting the entire Constitution on the chopping block. I don't think the founders intended for it to be a self-destruct button built into the Constitution itself. It was a self-correction tool. Uh, I, I think that they were more concerned in reading the Federalist Papers, Senator Campson, Senator from Charleston, and, uh, and reading the records of the Constitutional Convention, I think the Founding Fathers are far more worried about a runaway federal government than a runaway Article V Convention. And, and, and I feel like that's... <laughs> but, 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 and, I, and I think that's but the, the point being, that's, that's what everybody was worried about, is that the federal government get out of control, not the states. The states are far more, at least states like ours that live in a, in a balanced budget now, we're far more restrained than Washington is. So I'm less concerned about us destroying the Constitution than Washington is destroying the Constitution. And as Senator Campson pointed out, and I think this has been true in every state that's debated this, and I, certainly in the Constitution. It's not like you can just go and have a constitutional convention, as we keep hearing it referred to, rewrite the entire thing and then shove it down the state's throats. Everything proposed here still has to go through the same ratification process that you would if Congress proposed these things. So all we're saying is we're telling Congress we're taking the power out of your hands by doing this, and we're going to propose stuff y'all would never propose because I've never seen Congress vote to restrain their own power or control their own budget or limit their own terms. And I think that that's, I just want to be clear that when people say we're talking about shredding the Second Amendment or rewriting the Constitution, I don't, that's not the intent. That wasn't the founders' intent. And I know the subcommittee worked really hard, Mr. Chairman, to ensure that was certainly not the intent uh, with, with the state of South Carolina. So I, I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Chairman. Right, Mr. Chairman, if I could just say one other thing. Um, we do have, we also have in our package a, um, a, a bill that deals with a unfaithful delegate. If a delegate is unfaithful and does not stick to the the issues that are provided for in our joint resolution, then they would be subject to criminal penalties if they're un if they're an unfaithful delegate. And I'd like to also just probably uh, this is the last thing I'll, I'll read and if we're ready to vote, but I do want to get this out on the record. And this is from. Um, 
Jimmy Carter's Justice Department, actually, 1979. It's a memorandum opinion um, of the Attorney General. Um, and he was asked about can you limit the power of proposed amendments to the Constitution in Article 5? This is what he said. This is his conclusion. We are inclined to think that the convention clause has been misnamed. It should have been named the application clause because its basic purpose was to provide the regular governments of the states with the means of applying for amendments to the Constitution. And the convention procedure was simply a device, one of two devices considered by the framers during the evolution of the clause through which the demands of 13 contentious states were to be reconciled. The process was a flexible one. New York and the Anti-Federalists pressed for a convention in 1788 and 1789. On the other hand, if the legislatures feared the divisiveness of a general convention, meaning a runaway convention, yet there was in substantial ag agreement regarding some particular problem or issue, they could, as Hamilton suggested, generate specific proposals through the convention procedure without risking a general convention. So Hamilton believed that you could limit the convention to the issues at, at, at that, that, um, that the applications are asking for. And in this instance, we're asking for re federal restraint, term limits, and reigning in federal power in one resolution and the other is a balanced budget amendment. So I, I'll quote, cite Hamilton, no, no greater authority probably there than he believed that it could be a restrained convention. All right, and with that, that would be a motion? A motion to adopt the amendment, the committee amendment right. on 133. All right, Senator Garrett seconds that. All right. Any discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposition? There being no. none. There being no. A, all right. No. Three uh, registered. In fact, if you will register the opposition. Hey. Senator Harputlin, we hear you. Kemp. And Senator Kempson, okay. Uh, Senator Stevens. Senator Kemp. McLeod, I'm sorry. All right. If you are oppose this, let's see a show of hands. All right. And Senators McLeod, Senator Kempson, and Senator Harputlin. I can't. 15, okay. 15 to 8 with that. All right, by a vote of 15 to 8, that motion passes. All right. Senator Kempson, the other bill. That bill as amended. A motion right. to adopt the bill as amended. All right. Second. All right. And can we, any objection to using the same vote, uh, 15 to 8? Any objection to that? All right. There being none. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman, the next bill Mr. is Mr. Chair, I, I know there was a nod, a, nod, a nod to that. And I just want to just say just that, just that this bill is obviously one that has been around for a period of time. And basically, we get a chance to uh, use it on the Senate floor and be able to have a discussion on that. I've had a discussion with that with the majority leader, minority leader. And basically, the bill's going to pass committee. And so the senator from Charleston, I use him as an example, that has some reservations. He's worked on the bill in a way that he's gotten it such, such that we can support. And so customarily in the Senate, we end up moving um, um, a bill out of committee reserving all, all rights. And so today the bill needs to move forward, both of them, same way reserving all rights. And so we'll end up changing some things on the floor because there'll be other other amendments. This is a process. We need to end up, end up move, moving it forward. All right, Senator Campson. Mr. Chairman, I, um, the, the next bill is S-141, which is a concurrent resolution um, dealing with a balanced budget amendment, a resolution to propose the balanced budget amendment. Yeah, yes, it's not, a, the bill is reported out. It's not an amendment. I, I was talking about a balanced budget amendment was the subject matter of the, of the resolution, but we, we reported it out without amendment. The, 
out of right. the subcommittee. And that's S-141, the, it's called for a Article 5 convention for balanced budget. Okay. Motion made, seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposition? No. All right. Nay. Nay. All right. Uh, Senators Saab, Stevens, Kempson, any other? Matthews. Senator Matthews. Senator McLeod, y'all are looking, guys, Harpulian. please. Harpulian. Senator Harpulian. See you waving. Senator McLeod. Senator Matthews. Okay. All right. By whatever that vote is that Ernst and Young will tell us later. 13, 14 to 7 or thereabouts, that motion passes. And if you're any questions about your vote being recorded, check with our Ernst & Young representatives up here. All right, next. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the next bill is um, S887. This is a bill. The, the next bill is S887. This is a bill dealing with um, a oath being required by delegates that they would be faithful to the reason that the convention is called and if there is a um, a violation of that oath then they would be subject to criminal penalties um, the criminal penalty is up to 10 years and a felony um, we do have an amendment on the desk that clarifies that if an article 5 convention is called it's at that time that the general assembly would determine how commissioners and alternates to the convention that have to take the oath are elect are selected and so that is an amendment that's before us now a committee amendment mr chairman uh yes senator i was saying your senator uh yield for question yes uh senator i'm just curious um so you we're i think we're required uh to have an election and send delegates to vote um, to participate in the Constitutional Convention and discussion in the specific areas we've designated. My question is, how, how do we go about electing delegates? Are they elected during a regularly scheduled election or we don't have a special election? This is well, they, a popular vote, it's a general assembly vote. The general, uh, how, how do we go about it? the general assembly would Let's determine the way that the delegates are chosen at the time once the 34 the, the 34 state threshold is met that's the that's the threshold required for a convention once that happens then the the general assembly would determine how the delegates are are selected or who the delegates are and, and so how many states have passed this uh call for a constitutional convention so far the convention the the one furthest along is the balanced budget amendment which is 29 out of 34. i think the convention of states is 19 is that right out of the 34 required 17. and, and so 17. It's, it's, it's possible that once we reach this threshold that the general assembly decides to elect these delegates uh here at the state house rather than the whole day at large election or a statewide election is that true that has been the way that it, that's that's the way it was done with the original constitutional convention the the it was they were chosen through the legislature legislative branch of, of each state and that would probably be and the way as any, well yeah I, I got you so that's the discussion for the general assembly appointing the delegates is, is that that that's what the testimony was at subcommittee doing it the way that it was done in 17 well no it's really going to be left up to the general assembly at the time that the third that the uh, 34 state threshold is met there's no need to there'll be more clarity of what we want who we want when when and if that happens as opposed to us making that determination at this point in time it would be up to the General Assembly to, to make that decision once the 34 state threshold is met. 
that that's and, what and, the amendment would do. Right. And so, Senator, uh, this is the second year of a legislative session. So let's assume that 37 or whatever the threshold states don't pass uh, this legislation for the ballot, but 34, right. you know, we don't reach that threshold. So next year, which is probably where we hit it, that this bill has to start all over again in the House and then the Senate. Would that be true? Well, the House, the House has already passed um, a convention of states bill, and so we amended the House bill. And so that's yeah, the vehicle that I'm is further along on, end, on, that's further yeah, along at procedurally. The end of June, I guess what I'm saying is at the end of June, let's say this bill passes in, let's, well, I guess if the bill passes in the Senate, um, we, we don't have to come back next year, independent of the fact that 34 states have not passed the ballot, and I'm taking the balanced budget uh, uh, amendment issue because that's the majority of states, right. not the majority, but they're the, the, the biggest one. Do, the real question is, do we have to come back next year and, and discuss this, this, this legislation? No, this would be an ongoing resolution. When th These are referred to as applications for a C Article 5 convention, and, and they, are, they are ongoing applications that are not do not have to be renewed year in and year out until such time as they may be rescinded and as far as choosing a delegate um, I already talked to the majority leader I think what we do is we add to the sine die resolution that we can come back if and when a article 5 convention reaches 34 state threshold so we would be able to come back and, and make appointments as needed and not wait till the next legislative session if necessary. So um, that's, that's another, that's the way we would, we would deal with that. But these do not have to be passed every session. They are ongoing applications in, until such time as the state of South Carolina chooses to rescind their application. And some states have rescinded applications on the balanced budget amendment. I'm not sure any have rescinded the this this um, convention of states proposal. Um, I don't think those, any of those have been rescinded. And uh, my last question: I was just curious as to what is the what was the testimony with respect to term limits? Are we limiting members of Congress uh, to two? terms or one term or it, it's I, not I'm, it's not specific there's no specific proposal that's what if if you if there ever were a convention call that's what the convention would would determine what how do you handle the term limits what's the length of term but it's just the subject matter the topic of term limits for members of congress is one of the three subject matter that uh, it or issues that the convention could address that fiscal restraint and limitation or reigning in federal power. Uh, was there any testimony with respect to term limits? Certainly we would send our delegates with some instructions. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get the position that was offered, if any. I understand that the subject will be discussed, but well, I, was I, there I, any, I mean, no, I think the, at the, the idea is that if and when a 34 state threshold is reached, then, then that General Assembly at that time would end up appointing delegates and give them input on, you know, what we think as far as term limits, six years, 10 years, whatever it might be. That's the time to to address those issues, because we may think one thing today, but all of us conclude something different 10 years down the road when this could possibly happen, and many of us won't be here then as well. So it's the current General Assembly at the time, the 34 straight threshold, or 34 application threshold is, is reached that would, that would be tasked with doing that. We'd, we'd be having to look too far into the future sure. at this point. Senator, 
Harpootlin. Um, let me make sure I'm unmuted here. <laughs> the question is moot as who remembers that? Thank you. Jesse Jackson. Senator Sab, in that moment of mootness, Senator Sab, please. Real, real quick, Mr. Chair, if you would please. Senator from Charleston, you yield. Yes. So, Senator, I just want to follow up on what I consider to be the last point that the other the senator from most of Charleston uh, was was making. Um, so is it envisioned and of course, I am not in favor of convention of state. I'll say that for the record, but I'm trying to get an understanding as to what uh, my colleagues think in, in terms of how it would proceed. So I heard you when you responded to uh, Senator Kempson's uh, query about um, it's the General Assembly um, uh, that's in place at the time the threshold is, is met. Is it your view that what would occur, uh, let's assume hypothetically we're talking about the balanced budget amendment, uh, that the General Assembly would in effect uh, make a decision uh, as to whether as a state we are in favor or whether we are against, and that whomever the delegates are that are chosen are then bound by that decision or do they have any uh, leeway, if you will, uh, to uh, vote their conviction at the convention? I, I appreciate what I think is the limitations associated with the subject matter. Yeah. Uh, so now my question is the limitation as it relates to how they must or should well, vote. I, well, I think how you're going to vote is a more, much more problematic issue because you may have to cast votes on a lot of different procedural matters that can affect the outcome. Um, but, I mean, any delegate, if we as a body, you know, we're in favor of a balanced budget amendment, um, I'm sure we would elect someone who we were convinced were in favor of that balanced budget amendment. And the, 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 the if you look at the restraint in the bill on its, um, the one that carries the criminal penalties? Right. Yeah, I looked at that. And I'm going to offer an amendment to change that to five instead of ten years, because I learned after this, Mr. Chairman, before we're done, because we're the only state that would have a ten-year penalty for violation. It's been brought to my attention. Um, but so if you read the oath, the, <laughs> I'm going to okay, if you look at um, 887, and you can read the oath there, that's tab G. And the oath is... Um, on the second page, starting on line 10, I do solemnly swear to the best of my abilities, I will as a commissioner or alternate to an Article 5 convention and uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States. I will vote only as instructed by the vote of the people at a ratification convention or in accordance with my legislative instructions at a convention to propose amendments. Um, I understand any vote against the will of the people for an unauthorized amendment will be voided and I will be replaced, recalled, and subject to criminal prosecution. So it's, it's, you are, they are going to vote the way yeah. that you, that, that want them to, but that we want them to vote collectively. Yeah. So, so let's assume um, we've got a different issue. Uh, let's assume term limits. Um, I could, see a situation, I mean, with a balanced budget, either you're in favor or you're not, not a whole lot of gray there that well, I see. There is some gray in the sense of, the, it's not gray, but do you phase it in? Do you go cold turkey yes, from sir. one year to the next? I can appreciate okay, that. Okay, so I could see that, that being an issue about yep. phase in. Ab absolutely. Um, so you look at term limits for a second. Um, it could be two, three, four, or five. Um, What's the thinking 
as it relates to an issue of that sort? I'm not sure if our thinking matters. We, none of us may be probably will be here when this happens. I agree, um, but, but since we, we've got the matter before yeah. us, I think it's important. Well, I mean, for it us could be least. a range. I mean, the, we would know that we need to agree upon something. We need to have some instruction, so we may adopt a range. You know, and you go and get as lo as, as short a time or as long a time as you want. And so it would be, it would be um, some instructions like that that. And then you go and, and then a delegate would go and do the best that they could um, as far as if, you, if we if there was some idea that 10 years is good and but I could only get 12 then you know we that's an issue that we as a general assembly would would um, would address with those those delegates that's the way I envision it anyway so Charleston you have a motion yes I have a <laughs> I have a motion um, Five year first. Yeah, I have a motion to um, to to make the felony a five year felony uh, instead of a ten year felony. All right. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Got a second from Senator from Greenwood. Y'all making this a felony, eh? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. The amendments adopted. Senator from Charleston. Is there another amendment? So, yeah, the subcommittee. Sub, the, the, a motion to adopt the subcommittee amendment. All right, the motion is to adopt the subcommittee amendment. Senator from, I'm saying Greenwood. Are you Abbeville or Greenwood? McCormick. 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 <laughs> all right. All right, seconds it. All right, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Subcommittee is adopted. Senator from Charleston, favor report is amended. Favor report is amended. Senator from Charleston makes a motion for favor report is amended. Senator from McCormick seconds it. Right, any discussion? All in favor say aye. I saw it, Senator from Williamsburg. All right. A unanimous consent to apply the previous roll call vote. Is there any objection? All right. It'll be applied. I think it was either 13 to 7 or 14 to 7. 14 to 7. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Right. Hang on. Senator from Pickens. Okay. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. Is there another? 302. Mr. Oh. Mr. Chairman. Or two thirty-two oh five. Is that what you're asking, Senator from Pickens? Is there another bill? I, I thought we had adopted thirty-two oh five, but you're, you're saying we have not yet. That's what I'm told. Uh, well, let me let me go ahead. Can I make a brief statement? Absolutely. I, I've got several amendments that I wanted to offer, and, and they need perfecting. I just don't believe they're at the level that they ought to have them today. But I would like to ask, and, and there's one bill that we didn't get. That's a freestanding bill. Uh, it's 363. It's a term limits only bill, and I would like to make a motion that we bring that out and put it on the agenda and adopt it also. Well, I'm, I'm a term a, limits for, for who? Yeah. Term limits for state house or federal? Hang, federal, hang on, federal hang on. House. We yes. need to start with the state house. It just takes that his his request takes unanimous consent. Is there objection? There's objection. Senator from Charleston, we're back on the agenda with. Uh, 3205 subcommittee that, amendment on 3205 that, that is a house convention of states bill and um, the committee amendment is to amend that bill to the same language in F 133 so that we have a house and a senate vehicle All right on that so the motion is to adopt the, the senate language from s133 on to the house bill apply the vote from 132 and, and apply the vote from 133. 133 is there any objection to that mr chairman senator from darling question pardon me angry how do you do that you just we just, it's just a regular motion. It takes unanimous consent. How you we have a strike and insert amendment, an amendment that is in the book. Yes, okay. that we adopted in the subcommittee. So we're asking to adopt just, the subcommittee report. It just does report. mirror that. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's a motion and a second to adopt the uh, committee amendment that's in the book, which is the identical language that's in 133. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And the ayes have it. Senator Charleston, no. move favor report. Move for favor report is amended. All right. Motion from Senator Charles for favor report is amended. Second from Senator from McCormick. Yeah, all move other report counties to the desk for any of changes. Uh, Senator from Williamsburg moves that we adopt the previous vote. Yes, sir. All Sub right. Subject to anyone that wants to report to the desk.
Subject to anybody who wants to change their vote at the desk. All right, we'll record it as 13-7 again with anybody being able to change their vote and everybody's reserving their right. Senator Pickens has the right to amend on the floor. All right, next on the agenda, I think we're finally off all the Convention of States bills. Is that right? Y'all are all excused if you'd like to be. Um, 